Hello, I'm Alan Pierre-Luce. And I'm Jason. And we're going to teach you some nuclear chemistry today. <clears throat> so we'll start off with nuclei stability. The ratio of neutrons and protons determines the stability of a nucleus. Once past the atomic number 83, nuclei are unstable and are called radioisotopes. A radioisotope has an unstable nucleus and emits particles. That's why it is radioactive. These are the particles that can be emitted from nuclei. There are alpha, beta, and gamma particles, and also positrons. Refer to table N and O in your reference sheet for more info on that. Pause if you need to and look at the properties of these particles. One term you'll see a lot is transmutation. That is when the atomic nucleus of one element is changed into the nucleus of a different element. Natural transmutations have a single reactant. That means that the unstable nucleus emits a particle. Alpha and beta decay and positron emission are modes of decay in natural transmutations. Look at the slide and determine some of the properties of each type of decay. Artificial transmutations have two reactants. There are two types, fission and fusion. Fission is when heavy nuclei split into lighter nuclei through the bombardment of high-speed particles on the nucleus. Usually, a neutron does this. Fusion is when light nuclei are combined to produce a heavier nucleus. Here are some things to know about fusion. Products formed are not highly radioactive, unlike the products of fission reactions, and release more energy than fission. Extremely high temperatures and pressures are needed to overcome the repulsions of the positively charged nuclei. These conditions are satisfied in the sun. Deuterium and tritium, hydrogen 2 and hydrogen 3 respectively, are hydrogen isotopes that can be used to perform fusion. Mass defect is when matter is converted into energy. This is expressed by the equation E equals mc squared, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. So let's look at an example. Is this a natural or artificial transmutation? What is the decay mode? Pause here and try to find the answer. So you should have found the answer to be natural transmutation and alpha decay. There is only one reactant, so that means that this is a natural transmutation. And one of the products is an alpha particle, so this is alpha decay. So here is another sample reaction. Is this artificial or natural transmutation? Look closely at the reaction. This is an artificial transmutation because there are two reactants. So let's take a closer look at the two types of artificial transmutation. Is this a fission or a fusion reaction? This is a fusion reaction because two light atoms are combining to form a heavier atom. Which so is this a fusion or a fission reaction? And can you explain why? This is a fission reaction because a heavy atom, which is uranium, is split into two smaller atoms, which is barium and krypton. So let's take a look at half-lives. Radioactive substances decay at a constant rate and are not affected by any factors such as temperature, pressure, or concentration. Therefore, half-life cannot change. The time it takes for half of the atoms in a given sample of an element to decay is called the half-life. The shorter the half-life of an isotope, the less stable it is. A substance can never decay to zero. Look at these calculations to help you with the following problems. Let's look at this example. A radioactive element has a half-life of two days. Which fraction represents the amount of an original sample of this element remaining after six days? The answer is A, one-eighth. You can do this problem a couple of different ways, but I like imagining that the sample started off with one gram. There's a half-life of two days and a total number of days was six, so there's, two, there's three half-lives that have been gone through. 
So I represent that with arrows. So this represents two days. This represents two days. This represents two days. Altogether, that's six days. So each time the element gets cut in half. So we have one half here, one fourth here, and one eighth. And that's how you get your answer. Okay, so there's two more examples. Which radioisotope undergoes beta decay and has a half-life of less than one minute? The answer is 3 and 16. You can get that answer simply by looking at table N in your reference table. Now let's go to the second one. An original sample of K40 has a mass of 25 grams. After 3.9 times 10 to the 90 years, 3.125 grams of the original sample remains unchanged. What is the half-life of K40? So this problem is a little on the tricky side, but I'll show you guys how to do it. So we start off with 25 grams, and we get to 3.125 grams. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to keep cutting 25 in half until we get there. So I'm going to go to 12.5, then we're going to get 6.25, and finally we're going to get 3. 0.125 grams. How many half-lives was that? It's one, two, three half-lives. So we take the total amount of years that we had, which was 3.9 times 10 to the ninth, divide that by 3, and we get the answer to be 1 which is 1.3 times 10 to the ninth years. And there you go. So what are some of the uses of radioactive isotopes? One is dating. Carbon-14 is used to date previously living materials. Uranium-238 is used to date rocks and other geological formations. Tracers which you might have learned of in Living Environment or AP Bio, they are radioactive elements or compounds added to a material to monitor the material's distribution as it progresses through a system. Radioisotopes that are quickly eliminated from the body and have short half-lives are essential to avoid damaging healthy tissues. Carbon-14 can be used to map the path of carbon and metabolic processes, and radioactive P31 can be used to trace the uptake of phosphorus in a plant. There are some industrial applications as well. The thickness of materials can be measured by the amount of radiation from radioactive isotopes that are absorbed. The thickness of the material is directly related to the amount of radiation absorbed. Medical applications abound as well. I-131 can be used to detect and treat thyroid conditions. Cobalt-60 can be used to kill cancerous tumors. And TC-99 can be used to detect cancerous tumors. Obviously, we all know about nuclear power, and this is controlled fission, and they are used in nuclear power plants to produce electricity. Yeah. Let's take a look at some example problems for the uses of radioisotopes. Number one, the radioactive isotope carbon-14 can be used for, that would be A, determining the age of a sample. Two, which nucleides are used to, de to date the remains of a once living organism? That would be A, C14 and C12. Number three, cobalt-60 and iodine-131 are radioactive isotopes that are used in, that would be C, medical procedures. Which radioisotope is used to treat thyroid disorders? That would be B, iodine-131. Number five, which properties are most important in a radioisotope for medical use? That would be C, short half-lives and be quickly eliminated by the body.
Now, there are some risks associated with radioisotopes, as we all know. In medical uses, radioisotopes have the potential of damaging healthy tissues and cause mutations that can be passed from generation to generation. In nuclear power plants, fission results in decay products with long half-lives that are difficult to store and dispose of. Additionally, there is the risk of exposure to radioactivity to the surrounding ecosystem if an accident were to occur. So here is a sample problem to test your understanding of the risk of radioisotopes. A serious risk factor associated with the operation of a nuclear power plant is the production of A, acid rain, B, helium gas, C, greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide, or D, radioisotopes with long half-lives. The answer is D, radioactive isotopes with long half-lives. Let's take a look at some review questions. What is particle X in this reaction? In order to solve these type of questions, you want to make sure that the sum of the mass and atomic numbers in the reactant is equal to the sum of the mass and atomic number in the, in the product side. And by doing that, you'll find that the answer is A, an alpha particle, which has a mass number of 4 and an atomic number of 2. For the next question, you'll use the same method in order to find particle X. And by doing that, you'll find the answer is B, beryllium 9, which has an atomic number of 4. Also note that choice A has a mass number of 9 and an atomic number of 4, but the, ad but the element itself is lithium, which doesn't have an atomic number of 4. For the next question, what is the decay mode of potassium 37? For this type of question, you want to refer back to table N, and you'll find that the answer is B. Let's take a look at some more review questions. The half-life of a radioactive isotope is 20 minutes. What is the total amount of a 1 gram sample of this isotope remaining after 1 hour? So they give you the half-life of this isotope, which is 20 minutes. After 1 hour, you can find that, the three, that 3 half-lives will occur. If you start off with a 1 gram sample, after 1 half-life, you'll have half a gram remaining. After 2 half-lives, you have 1 fourth of a gram remaining. And after 3 half-lives, you'll have 1 eighth of a gram remaining. And that will be answer D. Radioactive cobalt-60 is used in radiation therapy treatment. Cobalt-60 undergoes beta decay. This type of nuclear reaction is called. That would be a natural transmutation as there is only one reactant. For the next question, you want to find what, the, what this reaction is an example of. That would be artificial transmutation because there are two products, two reactants.